My name is Bruno Spy. I work in Marseille as a research uh, senior scientist on public health, uh, and I'm elected a uh, European representative in the Government Council of the EIS. So today, HIV has become a chronic disease. So the, the main objective is to, to make that uh, patients are remain uh, um, access to treatment and to care for all life. And so we need to give things that uh, will uh, help patients to remain in care. Uh, there are actually much bet better progress for therapies, but the obstacles to remain in care is discrimination, is uh, judgment attitudes, sometimes from the um, healthcare uh, people. So uh, it's very important to develop a non-judgmental attitudes from the from the the doctors, the nurses, and all the all the people engaged in in uh, in care. Uh, it's also important to have a holistic care for patients because patients are getting older. They, they now they, they can have comorbidities and they need care focused not only on HIV but on uh, global health that they can have as uh, any anybody uh, getting older. Another important thing is that. Patients uh, usually come from key population, especially in Europe or North America, uh, and we need to have uh, to have care providers that are sensitive to key population issues. Uh, they have to take into account the way uh, of life that uh, some patients may have in terms of sexual life, in terms of drug use, uh, in terms also uh, from a different cultural background, from people coming from different parts of, of the world, such as migrants. And if they are not sensitive to to, to these points, the risk is that the patients do not feel well in the in care and the, and can be lost to follow up. Public health policies are very important and they are based on guidelines. And these guidelines have to be uh, written uh, first uh, in a in terms of scientific evidence. Uh, and that's the role of the IAS, to give scientific evidence, which is based both on experience and publications made by science. And uh, the second, the second uh, important point is that these guidelines should be written also with patients representative. Uh, it's very important that the decisions that are made in, in public health uh, have to be, be made with the beneficiaries of care and not only from uh, classic conventional ex experts. Uh, patients from the organ from patients' organization can be uh, very good as, uh, as uh, life experts and can know uh, if a recommendation is feasible or not, and if it's based on patients' needs or not. Public health system uh, must also recognize the important role of, uh, of peer education, which, is, uh, which happens some, in some countries, but which is not uh, all the time, not systematically uh, put in uh, uh, recommendations of the different countries. Um, why is it important? Because uh, peer support made by people who are sometimes patients themselves can be very important in terms of psych psychological well-being for patients. Uh, they, they have time to be listened, while doctors are usually very few times and are only technical. So it's very important to have a, a care which is holistic, including the psychosocial support. Uh, such there are a lot of data showing that psychosocial support uh, is important, uh, and uh, that's why uh, these guidelines uh, are must be based on evidence, including evidence which uh, related to psychosocial issues.
if we have healthcare professionals that uh, understand the needs of people living with HIV, it will be much easier to improve quality of life of patients. So the the, the education of professionals should be uh, should should help the professionals to understand the needs of different uh, uh, communities uh, to also to understand the way of of living of these communities and also to adapt the the solutions that can be delivered to 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 these patients Um, they they, the the education should aim also to um, obtain a perfect attitude from the healthcare professionals with no judgment, with respect of confidentiality uh, and with with, uh, uh, a certain distance, but also a, a, a good relationship with the patient. Because we know that the, the relationship between the patient and the, the healthcare giver is essential in good adherence and in good retention in care. I think that uh, in the HIV field, the relationships between uh, patients and, and, and doctors is usually quite good because it has been 40 years ago that we work together, patients, activists, scientists, uh, and doctors to uh, improve all solutions to uh, for, for better quality of life. In other fields of, um, of health, the relationship between patients and, uh, and doctors is really different. And I think the uh, lessons we learned from 40 years of uh, HIV fight should be transferred to other fields of medicine. My name is Colleen Cunningham, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor. I currently uh, chair of pediatrics at University of California, Irvine, and pediatrician in chief at the Children's Hospital of Orange, also known as CHOC. I've been taking care of HIV positive children and youth uh, since the 1980s. I'm Dorothy Dow. I'm an assistant professor um, of pediatric infectious diseases at Duke University, as well as assistant research professor at Duke Global Health Institute. Um, And I am an associate director of the CIFAR um, clinical core at Duke and also a um, co-site leader of the KCMC or Kilimanjaro Christian Research um, Center, Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center and Duke um, sites here in Tanzania. I think there are many factors. Um, I think, you know, over time, quality of life has certainly um, been able to improve for many people who live with HIV. Um, However, there is different access points for receiving treatment, um, and that treatment looks different, you know, in different settings. So I work primarily in Tanzania, um, which is in East Africa, and in our setting, access to antiretroviral therapy is, is free, but we don't necessarily have the same drugs available here that you might have in the UK or the United States. Um, In the last couple of years, we now have a medicine called dolutegravir or an integrase inhibitor that's been pretty um, life altering for many who are able to receive it. Um, The medication is free. I think I said that. but you know there is a lot of stigma and a lot of fear in coming to the clinic to test. And so still, um, I think the global stats are just over half of children um, and adolescents who live with HIV are actually um, receiving treatment. And reasons for that vary, but I think a big part of that is perhaps um, not knowing that they're infected. And so Um, We often have children and adolescents who come in very, very sick as their presentation, and it's hard um, sometimes for the medications to work, you know, fast enough and well enough um, to get them back to a a stable um, 
presentation and able to go on and live a good life. However, we now know that if you test and, and treat um, soon thereafter, um, the medications that we have even in Tanzania, like dolutegravir, can, and can really keep um, a very strong quality of life. And um, you know, people don't have to get really sick. You can go on and have the life expectancy of someone who does not live with HIV as long as you, know, you have access to your medication and you take it as prescribed. I, I completely agree with what you just said. I, I want to emphasize the stigma portion of it because there's many, many people whose virus is controlled, their physical health is fine, but the impact of both internal stigma, so pressure they're putting on themselves, as well as external stigma, stigma uh, have a huge impact on individuals' quality of life. So uh, if they're ashamed or embarrassed or um, even just focused on keeping this secret from everybody, it's, it's a huge mental drain. And, and it really impacts people's quality of life. The other thing I want to emphasize is, is poverty. Uh, if you are struggling to put a roof over your head or to feed your children, uh, then um, going to the doctor to get your antiretrovirals or paying for the labs that go with it, or even just remembering to take the meds every day, um, becomes lower priority because these other things are such pressing issues. So I, I would I would consider really those two things to be among the the greatest uh, impact. And, and certainly, when people's life is stable, they have a roof, they have food. Um, then they're much more likely to take their meds, and they're much more likely to then overall have good physical health uh, to go with better mental health. So the role of healthcare professionals is really crucial um, to how, how patients do um, who live with HIV. I think it starts with them coming through the door. So um, I work primarily in Tanzania and um, certainly there still uh, remains some stigma within healthcare providers. Um, and sometimes patients might avoid coming to clinic because they feel very stigmatized from healthcare providers. So I think, you know, it, it starts there that um, clients feel welcome and that they're going to get that, that they will receive good care from, from the providers. Um, I think a holistic approach in looking at the whole, the whole person, um, as was mentioned, I think previously, um, you know, living with HIV comes often with a lot of other barriers, um, financial, getting to the clinic, um, and, you know, food insecurity is something that a lot of our patients deal with as well. And so, you know, if they're prioritizing sort of eating versus making it to the clinic and taking medications, um, you know, they're going to prioritize sort of the, the survival um, and our social workers and our, our clinicians need to be really well aware um, of some of these other challenges so that, you know, when we prescribe medication, we enable patients to be able to, to have all the things they need in order to, to have good adherence and to take their medicine properly. Um, so the social workers in our setting are really critical. Um, you know, sometimes there's stigma in the home. Um, sometimes, you know, many of the, the children or the adolescents that we take care of, their parents have died of HIV. And so they're living in households where they might have recently moved in with an, an aunt or an uncle. And sometimes those environments might not be um, ideal. And so the social workers can go and kind of do home assessments and, and make sure that um, the, the child or the adolescent's really well supported. Um, along with that, um, you know, having good access to mental health care. Um, we know that those living with HIV tend to have a higher risk of having mental health challenges, um, very much associated with the stigma that's been discussed previously. And so our integration of mental health, I think, is, is really critical within the, the HIV clinic. Um, sometimes we are able to refer to mental health care, but those referrals are often not... Um, Action. So, you know, people, there's stigma around mental health, so they don't actually go to those clinics. So I think 
the more we can have healthcare providers that are friendly and um, not having stigma themselves, the more our clinics can be pediatric and youth friendly um, so that, you know, our, our patients feel like they can ask questions, they can bring their challenges in their homes and get some help. Those are all really, really critical um, qualities that the healthcare professions bring to the table in order to support patients with HIV to be able to adhere to their medication and have a good quality of life. Your uh, comments are, I think, are in, entirely in keeping with my experience uh, in the U.S. I think being able to uh, deliver non-judgmental health care, um, and, and that includes the whole team. So it doesn't do any good if the physician is non-judgmental, um, if the nurse or the pharmacist uh, is is uh, showing their stigma or their biases. I think that has to be an entire team that is supportive. I think the other really important point is the, the need for the healthcare professionals to provide education. Uh, we often assume that the patient, because they're HIV infected, uh, knows everything there is to know about their disease and their medicines. And it's really surprising how often that even if it was explained to the person shortly after diagnosis, at that time, they weren't really able to hear anything other than they have HIV. Uh, and so you often have to repeat, explain, uh, and continue to reinforce what the medicines are doing and, and what the impact is over time. And as new medicines become available and new data become available, it's important that we keep our patients up to date on um, what their options are and what what uh, what the newest information tells us about their health care. Um, but really, with good health care and good community and family support, people can live perfectly normal lives and long lives um, with, with HIV infection. My name is Colleen Cunningham, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor. I currently uh, chair of pediatrics at University of California, Irvine, and pediatrician in chief at the Children's Hospital of Orange, also known as CHOC. I've been taking care of HIV positive children and youth uh, since the 1980s. I'm Dorothy Dow. I'm an assistant professor um, of pediatric infectious diseases at Duke University, as well as assistant research professor at Duke Global Health Institute. Um, and I am an associate director of the CIFAR um, clinical core at Duke and also a um, co-site leader of the KCMC or Kilimanjaro Christian Research um, Center, Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, and Duke um, sites here in Tanzania. Early on in, in the uh, epidemic, I used to say to people that, you know, this debate about when to start people on therapy wouldn't exist if we had something where you had to take medicine once every six months and it had no side effects, we'd have everybody on treatment. Early on, you know, the medications, you had to take them many times a day and they were relatively toxic. So that's why there was a debate about starting medicine. But we're now talking about medications that have the potential to take once every three months, once every six months, um, and that would keep your virus suppressed with, with very few side effects. And that really becomes a game changer as long as people can afford it. So some of them are long acting antiretroviral medicines. Uh, right now, uh, the, they're ones that you take by injection, but maybe we'll eventually have long acting ones that you can just take by mouth. There's also uh, monoclonal antibodies or broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. That field has really uh, blossomed in the last few years. Uh, we started with antibodies that were relatively potent and, uh, but, but didn't last um, 
for months. They would, you know, last for many weeks, but not for months. But people were able to figure out how to modify those antibodies. So they literally will last for months. So a single injection could give you levels of those antibodies uh, for four months, five months. And they've been able to develop the antibodies so that they're even more potent. That is better able to neutralize virus and better able to neutralize uh, all the viruses in the community. So as these broadly neutralizing antibodies have improved, uh, they're really looking very, uh, very hopeful as a potential future treatment um, to add to our current therapies, but that would also give the potential where somebody might get one dose every three months, four months, um, and then not have to wor worry about taking medicines every day. So the more we move towards uh, medicines that aren't dependent on people taking them every single day, the more we're able to treat the people that have a hard time taking medicine every day. So that allows us to have more and more in infected individuals with complete viral suppression and health. Dorothy, what are your thoughts on this? Yes, I think it's so exciting that long acting injectables are, you know, now being FDA approved and being rolled out and monoclonals are are very much, uh, you know, on the horizon with incredible promise. Um, working here in Tanzania, um, we know that there's going to be quite a time lag before we um, likely have any of these drugs available to our patients in this setting. Um, and so I think one of the real key developments that has happened um, that was really, um, I guess, put pushed forward quicker than it might have otherwise been due to COVID-19 was though there's still daily pills that we could um, prescribe medications for three months or even six months to patients that were suppressed. Um, and that really lessens the number of patients that a healthcare provider needs to see every day. Um, and by lessening that number of patients, you have more time that you can interact with an individual patient and perhaps you know give them better care, talk more about their family environment, their home situation, you know, stigma, food insecurity, all of these really important issues, mental health. Um, and so though we don't necessarily have the technologies coming to us right away, we have made some implementation of uh, prescribing for longer duration. And that was largely spurred by COVID-19 and wanting less people in the waiting room. But I think one of the benefits has been that um, the clinics are less burdened day to day and healthcare providers can spend a bit more time with, with patients. Um, and again, you know, dolutegravir has been available in, in other parts of the world for quite some time. Um, we just heard from the government that we're going to have 10 milligram tablets. Right now, we only have 50 milligram tablets for adults. So our children still don't have access to integrase inhibitors. Um, so I think also that's going to be a new big development that we can treat, you know, younger children with a really potent drug and, and hopefully get them suppressed too. So though it's not, you know, quite the, the, advanced technology, it's sort of things on the ground that I think are helping healthcare providers to take better care of their patients. I'd like to add to that, Dorothy. Uh, the coming in less frequently to clinic, besides giving the provider more time, it's also less burden for the person. You feel it's making you disclose to people that you're infected because you're having to spend a whole day every month in the clinic. Um, and, and so, you know, if it's only once every three months or even once every six months that you have to uh, go to clinic, it really allows people to have a more normal life and hold down a job or take care of their family. So I think it, it's also an advantage in that way. And actually, that's been standard in the U.S. for years. Um, nobody comes in once a month. Um, but it but it was a practice that was continued oftentimes in, in many other places as a way of sort of keeping track, I guess, of who was taking medicine. And so it's great if if moving away from that. I will say, interestingly, for the adolescents who come to the clinic, you know, on the same day, 
many of them say, no, I want to come every month because I want to see my friends. So, you know, the context really matters and the, the clinic setup and who's coming really matters. So I think for the majority, every three months is, is super. Um, and then those who want to come um, more for social reasons, you know, can do so, but they don't have to necessarily see the healthcare provider. My name is Ricardo Sobi Dias. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I work in the Federal Medical School of Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm an infectious disease physician and I do translational research at my institution. Brazil was doing a very good job in, in screening, doing early diagnosis, and, and bringing patients to care. Uh, for you to have an idea, in 2019, we include something like almost 80,000 new cases on treatment. Uh, and that was a linear increase in over time. And we had a big loss with the pandemic. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, we stopped uh, screening the way that we usually did, and the numbers of new cases uh, dropped almost 75% uh, in, in 2020, 2021. And so uh, the pandemic was a big barrier uh, for the early diagnosis, the, the screening, and especially bringing patients to, to care. Uh, right now, with, with uh, the, 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 the pandemic being more uh, controlled in Brazil, uh, we are again doing a big effort to uh, bring back patients that were lost to follow up and also to start screening again those, those patients. Um, HIV and AIDS in Brazil uh, was always a priority for the needs of health. So uh, we always took very good care uh, of those patients. Uh, we, we care for, for uh, interrupting the transmission chain. Uh, we are increasing uh, PrEP treatment. And, uh, and right now we are trying to catch up and, and bring those patients that were lost to care uh, again uh, for treatment and uh, also trying again to make campaigns to diagnose patients and uh, uh, do massive testing. We, we, we have been involved uh, in, in training some healthcare professionals, uh, especially the new ones, uh, to maximize uh, attention uh, to HIV AIDS patients, uh, to maximize adherence uh, to the treatment. We, we, we understand that uh, many patients uh, will have some barriers to the treatment, uh, especially related to some uh, discriminations and it's very interesting. We, we have a project in Brazil that uh, we're uh, doing some small clinical trials to treat patients uh, aiming the cure of HIV. So we, we have uh, some, some interventions that may try to make those patients to decrease the, the, the number of infected cells. And we had some good results. And the point was that after we had those results, something like 500 patients uh, unsolicited uh, came to us uh, to be part of this research. And we are trying to understand why they did it. And uh, we, we trying to do some social behavioral research looking at this. And we saw that the main thing was uh, self-discrimination. So the HIV stigma was very, very high among those patients. So they were patients that were well, 
they were treating the HIV disease, so they don't have any um, reason to, to be uncomfortable with the treatment, but they all want to get rid of, of, of HIV. And uh, so, and this was mainly due to some, some self-stigma and discrimination. Learning that, uh, we try to, to uh, uh, work with some physicians to uh, bring this to attention that in order to maximize the treatment adherence to those patients, we need to understand that they have some barriers uh, and, and, and those barriers uh, are uh, the self-stigma and discrimination. So uh, we need to make uh, the, the treatment more affordable uh, and more friendly to, to those patients. So that, that's going to be the next effort. Uh, to try to, to uh, understand this and, and to train the young physicians uh, to be more supportive to, to those patients that need to be treated. Yeah, one, one important thing that we are noticing uh, in the treatment of, of patients is that uh, they are getting older. Uh, uh, they, they, they have uh, the effects of HIV, the aging process, and the long-term treatment with antiretrovirus. So uh, we always try to pay attention to the new drugs that may be more friendly to the patients. Uh, we always try to understand that those patients will have a long journey uh, with, with the treatment uh, that uh, until we have a cure, the treatment will be for life for those patients. That, uh, as I mentioned before, they are getting older. So uh, the, the, the way that I understand this is that we, we need to, to pay attention to all the, the details of, of the long-term treatment and, and the comorbidities that those patients have. The good news is that uh, we also notice that the quality of life of this, those patients and the survival rate is increasing over time. So it's, uh, it might be considered an advantage for those patients to have a chronic disease that bring them to care. They can be seen uh, more frequently by the physicians they can, they can uh, do monitoring uh, lab tests, and therefore they can they can have uh, new comorbidities uh, being diagnosed and being treated. And it, it's it, it, we are very glad to note that uh, the survival rate of of HIV patients nowadays. Um, pretty much close to the survival rate of, of any person uh, without those chronic diseases. My name is Marta Bufito. I'm a consultant physician in infectious disease and HIV medicine with an interest in clinical pharmacology. I'm the HIV service director at Chelsea Westminster Hospital, and I'm also the clinical research facility lead, and I am academically linked to Imperial College London. Nowadays, we know that initiation of antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible, it's very important for people living with HIV that have just been diagnosed with HIV. Starting therapy early allows the viral load to decrease quickly and allows people to achieve an undetectable viral load so that their health is protected against potential opportunistic infections or non-HIV-associated 
morbidities. And also it's very important because today we know that having an undetectable viral load means being able to not transmit HIV. And this is why we talk about U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. So starting antiretroviral treatment early means that people are doing something good for their own health, but they're also doing something helpful for public health in general. In order to start antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible, it is quite important to be aware of our HIV status. And to do that, it is important to test for HIV. You might be aware of testing campaigns in different countries that have increased the uptake of HIV testing. And this is, again, key to improve the health of the population and to improve the health of people living with HIV because it allows people to start antiretroviral therapy. Unfortunately, nowadays, there is still stigma associated to HIV infection, and it is a stigma that limits the confidence of people to actually go and test for HIV. So if I can say something to the whole world is not to be scared of HIV infection, is a manageable chronic infection. People who take antiretroviral therapy are doing very well. And it is again very important to know about HIV and not to be discriminated because HIV infection. Today, barriers to antiretroviral therapy initiation still exist globally. They can be different in different areas of the world. In high income countries, stigma may limit the wish of people testing for HIV. In low to intermediate income countries, Stigma is also present, stigma associated to HIV infection is also present, or availability of drugs can also still unfortunately affect the possibility of starting antiretroviral therapy. What can limit adherence to antiretroviral therapy in the modern world is people who may not be able to see their doctors frequently, may not be able to switch their medications to something more modern and best tolerated. And this is why as a community who delivers clinical care to people living with HIV, we need to make sure that we are well informed and people who attend our clinics are well informed and uh, there is no stigma against HIV infection, against people who live with HIV, so that they're free to attend the clinics without fear of being judged. Over the past 20 years, we have learned a lot about HIV infections and about antiretroviral therapy. Nowadays, antiretroviral therapy are easier to take and they're better tolerated. Complications uh, associated to HIV infection can be prevented and avoided if clinicians are well trained on HIV infection antiretroviral therapy in patients are made part uh, of what antiretroviral therapy can do and uh, how important it is um, to take it every day. New treatment for HIV are being studied and are becoming available. And importantly, they're getting easier and easier for people living with HIV to make sure that there is more choice um, and there is uh, a future with less side effects to medications and even a future with less medications while HIV replication is controlled and the quality of care of people with, living with HIV is improved.
I think it's very important for uh, clinicians to be aware of the consequences of aging with HIV. Not everybody aging with HIV um, is experiencing uh, negative health outcomes. However, aging with HIV has been shown to be associated to a higher risk for polymorbidity and polypharmacy. And I think key here is knowledge of clinicians to manage polymorbidity and polypharmacy in the context of HIV infection and when antiretroviral drugs are prescribed to make sure that we um, allow people living with HIV to have a good quality of life for as long as possible for all of their lives, which now are remarkably prolonged because of antiretroviral therapy advances.